Chapter 21, The Prosperity Decade, 1920 to 1928. Individual Choices, Clara Bow. At the age of 21, Clara Bow became the It Girl, star of the movie It, loosely based on Eleanor Glenn's novel. It was sex appeal, or in Glenn's words, an inner magic and animal magnetism, and Clara Bow, the It Girl, was the most popular movie star of the late 1920s. Clara was born in Brooklyn in 1905. Her father frequently abandoned Clara and her schizophrenic mother, who showed no affection for her daughter. Clara grew up streetwise, able to defend herself with her fists. She left school at 13, began to work, and decided to become a movie actress. Clara's mother threatened to kill her if she persisted with acting, but she was confined to a mental institution in 1922 and died soon after. Bo landed a contract with the Hollywood studio by the time she was 17 and appeared in 35 movies before reaching the age of 21. In the early 1920s, some films were emphasizing sexuality to attract audiences, as can be seen in the advertising in the individual voices feature at the end of this chapter. Thus, though Bao's first substantial role was as a tomboy, by 1925 her studio labeled her the hottest jazz baby in films. The New York Times agreed, she radiates an elfin sensuousness. It, released in 1927, clinched her fame as the essential flapper. F. Scott Fitzgerald claimed that Clara Bow is the quintessence of what the term flapper signifies, pretty, impudent, superbly assured, as worldly wise, briefly clad, and hard-burled tough as possible. He added that thousands of young women were now patterning themselves after her. On the screen, Bow was flirtatious and sensuous, conscious of her sexuality and willing to use it, and aggressive in accomplishing her goal. In the process, she usually revealed as much skin as the censors permitted. She lived in much the same way, attracting Hollywood's handsomest men, making them her lovers, and discarding them for someone new. Perhaps reflecting on her parents' marriage, she told a reporter, marriage ain't women's only job no more. I wouldn't give up my work for marriage. Despite her huge popularity and succession of famous lovers, Beau remained deeply lonely. Her working class behavior and speech and the gossip about her sex life made her a social outcast in Hollywood. When silent films gave way to the talkies, the looming overhead microphone became her enemy, reminding her of her childhood stutter and threatening her self-confidence. She made successful talking movies, but several public scandals led to cancellation of her studio contract. At the age of 25, Clara Bow seemed to has been. She married actor Rex Bell and moved into a remote ranch in Nevada. She starred in two films in 1933, both successful at the box office and with the critics, but Bow was done with Hollywood. Eventually, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia and depression. Later, she returned to live in solitude in LA and died there in 1965. In 1957, a poll of surviving silent film directors, actors, and cameramen placed Clara Bow a close second to Greta Garbo as the greatest actress of the silent films. Called the Jazz Age and the Roaring Twenties, the 1920s sometimes seems a whirl of conflicting images. Flappers, symbolized by Clara Bow, were flaunting new freedoms for women while prohibition, although poorly enforced, seemed an effort to preserve 19th century values. The booming stock market um, promised prosperity to all with money to invest, even as thousands of farmers abandoned the land because they could not survive financially. Business leaders celebrated the booming economy while many wage earners in manufacturing endured the destruction of their unions and saw their legal protections evaporate. White-sheeted Klansmen, the KKK, marched as self-proclaimed defenders of Protestant American values and white supremacy, but African American art, literature, and music were flowering. Amid these seeming paradoxes, the economy roared almost like a shiny new roadster fueled by easy credit and consumer spending, virtually unregulated until the fuel ran out. The bullish decade. Considering the questions, what was the basis for the economic expansion of the 1920s and what weakness ex weaknesses existed within the economy? By 1920, the American economy had been thoroughly industrialized, with most industry controlled by large corporations run by professional managers. During the 1920s, the growth of the automobile industry dramatized the new prominence of industries producing consumer goods. This significant change in direction carried implications for advertising, banking, and even the stock market. The Economics of Prosperity With the end of the war in 1918, the government canceled most orders for war supplies. Large numbers of recently discarded military or discharged military and naval personnel swelled the ranks of job seekers. Given wartime shortages and overtime pay, many Americans had been earning more than they could spend. At the end of the war, their spending helped to delay the post-war slump in the economy until 1920 and 1921. Gross domestic product dropped by 4.3% between 1919 and 1920, then fell 8.6% between 1920 and 1921. During the war, unemployment affected only about 1% of the workforce. The jobless rate increased to 5% in 1920 and 12% in 1921. Some employers cut hours and wages. Figure 21.1 uh, presents earnings for three groups of Americans and indicates the impact of recession in the early 1920s. In the end, reduced earnings, unemployment, and declining demand halted the ramp rampaging infl inflation of 1918 and 1919. The economy quickly rebounded. Gross domestic product increased by 15% between 1921 and 1922, a bigger jump than during the booming war years. 
Unemployment remained low from 1923 to 1929, and prices for most manufactured goods remained relatively stable. Thus, many Americans seemed somewhat better off by 1929 than in 1920. Targeting, targeting consumers. By the 1920s, many business leaders understood that persuading Americans to buy their products, that is, advertising, was crucial to keeping, keeping the economy healthy. The marketing of Listerine provided a successful model. Though Listerine had originally been intended as a general antiseptic, Gerard Lambert in 1921 developed a more profitable use for it when he plucked the obscure term halitosis, bad breath, from a medical journal. Until then, few Americans had been concerned about their breath. Through aggressive advertising, Lambert fostered anxieties about the effect of halitosis on popularity, basically he made people afraid to have bad breath, and made millions by selling Listerine to combat this condition, this fear that he's helping to generate within consumers. There's a wonderful ad, by the way, on page 570 for Listerine that you should definitely take a look at. Other entrepreneurs also rushed to sell products by defining needs that consumers had not previously identified. In 1924, General Mills first advertised Wheaties as the breakfast of champions, tying breakfast cereal to athletic prowess. Americans responded by buying those products and many others. We grew up founding our dreams on the infinite promises of American advertising, Zelda Sarah Fitzgerald later wrote. Changing fashions also encouraged buying. Short hairstyles for women led to the, de the development of hair salons and stimulated sales for the recently invented bobby pin. Cigarette advertisers began to target women as when the American Tobacco Company urged women to reach for a lucky instead of a sweet to obtain a fashionably slim figure. Disposable products promoted recurrent purchases, notably Kotex, the first manufactured disposable sanitary napkin, their tampons, um, introduced in 1921 and the first disposable handkerchiefs introduced in 1924 and later known as Kleenex. Other technological advances contributed more prominently to the consumer-oriented economy. In 1920, about one-third of all residences had electricity. By the end of the decade, electrical power had reached nearly all urban homes, but fewer than 10% of farm homes. As the number of residences with electricity increased, advertisers encouraged housewives to save time and labor by using electric washing machines, irons, vacuum cleaners, and toasters. Between 1919 and 1929, consumer expenditures for household appliances grew by more than 120%. Increased consumption brought changes in spending habits. Before the war, most families saved their money until they could pay cash for what they needed. In the 1920s, retailers encouraged buyers to buy now and pay later. Many consumers did so, taking home a new radio and worrying about paying for it tomorrow. By the late 1920s, about 15% of all retail purchases were made through the installment plan, especially furniture, phonographs, washing machines, and refrigerators. Charge accounts in department stores became popular, and finance companies, which made loans, grew rapidly. The automobile driving the economy. The automobile epitomized, meaning it really represented, the consumer-oriented economy of the 1920s. Early automobiles were luxuries, but Henry Ford developed a system that drove down production costs. Ford, a former mechanic, built his success on the Model T introduced in 1908. As early as 1918, the Model T dominated the market. By 1927, Ford had produced more than 15 million of them. Get the prices down to the buying power, Ford ordered, and his dictatorial management style combined with technological advances and high worker productivity to bring the price of a new Model T down to as low as $290 by 1927, which is equivalent to $3,700 today for a brand new car. It was a dream come true for many Americans. Families came to love their ungraceful but reliable tin whizzies, so named because of their lightweight metal bodies. The Model T sacrificed style and comfort for durability, ease of maintenance, and the ability to handle almost any road. It made Henry Ford a folk hero, a wealthy one. By 1925, his company showed a daily profit of some $25,000. If you have a minute, you should go to YouTube and look up Ford Model T's off-roading. These things could really go anywhere. Cars today, uh, I think, would have a much more difficult time in many conditions that Model Ts had to go through. And think about it, we didn't have nearly as many paved or well cared for roads back in the 1920s. So these cars, they really did have to be able to handle any sort of terrain. But it's really amusing to see them, you know, uh, going over terrain that you would think that a car, especially an old car, could never actually get over. Ford provides an example of efforts by American entrepreneurs to reduce labor costs by improving efficiency. Work on Ford's assembly line, shown in the photo on the next page, became a thoroughly dehumanizing experience. Ford workers were prohibited from talking, sitting, smoking, singing, or even whistling while working. As one critic put it, workers were to put nut 14 on bolt 132, repeating, repeating, repeating until their hands shook and their legs quivered. 
Ford's first assembly line in 1913 was not the first moving assembly line, but it was the one that attracted worldwide attention and imitation. It was, in many ways, an extension of the work of Frederick W. Taylor. Uh, we talked about Taylorism earlier, an industrial engineer who built a national reputation on his ability to take a complex operation requiring a high level of skill and break it down into, the most co into its component parts. Taylor redesigned complex work processes so they could be done by relatively unskilled workers who required little training and were easy to replace. Then, efficiency experts conducted time and motion studies to determine the ideal speed at which each task should be performed. Taylor described his system in Principles of Scientific Management, published in 1911. His emphasis on efficiency made that concept an important goal for manufacturers and for many Americans more generally. Ford paid his workers well and increased their pay if they completed Americanization classes. Ford workers earned enough money to buy their own Model T also. Ford's high wages pushed other automakers to increase pay for their workers to keep them from defecting to Ford. Auto workers thus came to enjoy some of the consumer buying previously restricted to middle and upper middle, uh, excuse me, and upper income groups. Competition helped to keep auto prices low. Other automobile companies challenged Ford's predominance, notably General Motors or GM, founded by William Durant in 1908, and Chrysler, created by Walter Chrysler in 1925. GM and Chrysler adopted many of Ford's production techniques, but their cars also offered more comfort and style than the Model T. Ford stopped producing the Model T in 1927 when Chevrolet passed Ford in sales. The next year, Ford introduced the Model A, which incorporated some features promoted by his competitors. He basically made his cars a little bit more comfortable. Advertising made the automobile the symbol not only of the ability of Americans to acquire material goods, but also of technology, progress, and the freedom of the open road. American consumers were receptive. By the late 1920s, about 80% of the world's registered vehicles were in the United States. By then, America's roadways supported, sported nearly one automobile for every five people. The automobile industry often led the way in advertising and uh, devising new sales techniques. By 1927, two-thirds of all American automobiles were sold on credit. GM began introducing new models every year, encouraging owners to keep up with changes in design, color, and features. Small automakers soon found they could not compete with Chrysler, Ford, and GM, the big three. By 1929, the big three were making 83% of all cars manufactured in the country. The industry had become an oligopoly. Changes in banking and business. Henry Ford brought automobiles within reach of most Americans, and A.P. Giannini did something similar for banking. The son of Italian immigrants, Giannini founded the Bank of Italy in 1904 as a bank for shopkeepers and workers in San Francisco's Italian neighborhood. Until then, most banks had only one location in the center of a city and limited their services to business and subsistence to businesses and substantial citizens. Giannini brought his bank to ordinary people by opening branches near people's homes and workplaces. Called the greatest innovator in 20th century American banking, Giannini broadened the base of banking by encouraging working class people to open small accounts and to borrow for such purposes as car purchases. In the process, his bank, renamed the Bank of America, which you've probably heard of, became the third largest in the nation by 1927. Ford and Giannini were not the only entrepreneurs to emerge as popular and respected public figures. Perhaps the ultimate glorification of the entrepreneur came in 1925 in a book entitled The Man Nobody Knows. The author, Bruce Barton, founder of a leading advertising agency, suggested that Jesus Christ could best be understood as a business executive who had picked up 12 men from the bottom ranks of business and forged them into an organization that conquered the world. Portraying Jesus' parables as the most powerful advertisements of all time, Barton's book led the nonfiction bestseller lists for two years. Even though the number of corporations increased steadily throughout the 1920s, corporate mergers also accelerated, continuing earlier patterns toward greater economic concentration, thinking of like maybe the building of trusts, monopolies in earlier decades. By 1930, 5% of American corporations were receiving 85% of all net corporate income. Janini's bank and Ford's company survived as relics of family management in an economy increasingly dominated by giant corporations and faceless corporate managers. For most large corporations, ownership, thousands of stockholders, and control, salaried managers, continued to grow more remote from each other, especially as large numbers of people came to see stock ownership as a short-term speculative venture, a way to get rich quick rather than a long-term investment. Get rich quick. During the 1920s, the stock market captured people's imagination as the fast track to riches. Speculation, or buying a stock with the expectation of selling it at a higher price later, ran rampant. Popular magazines proclaimed that everyone could participate and get rich quickly. By 1929, 4 million Americans, equivalent to about 10% of American households, owned stock. And if you're sitting there wondering, what's going to happen when the Great Depression starts, that's exactly what you need to be wondering. Keep the end in mind, okay? 
Just as Americans purchased cars and radios on the installment plan, some also bought stock on credit. Some people bought stocks on margin, which is when they would pay part of the cost and owe the rest to the stockbroker. Many people borrowed money to buy stocks. Such ventures carried risk. If the investor paid $50 for a stock costing $100 with the remainder on margin or with borrowed money and the stock price advanced to $150, the investor could sell, pay off the debt, and gain a net profit of $50. Unfortunately, if the stock price fell to $50, then the investor would still owe $50. So there's a lot of economic risk here. Driven partly by real economic growth and partly by speculation, stock prices rose higher and higher. Common stock prices tripled between 1920 and 1929. As long as the market stayed bullish and stock prices kept climbing, prosperity seemed endless. The ever-rising stock prices and corporate div dividends of the 1920s encouraged the creation of holding companies. For example, Samuel Insel's empire of electrical utilities companies included many holding companies, which existed solely to own the stock of other companies, some of which existed primarily to own the stock of yet others. The financial well-being of such structures rested on the ability of the operating companies to pay regular dividends, meaning that they're paying back investors, since those dividends enabled the holding companies to pay dividends on their bonds. An interruption in the dividends from the operating companies could bring the collapse of the entire pyramid, swallowing up the investments of speculators. Although the stock market remained the most popular path to instant riches, other speculative opportunities abounded. A land boom developed when people poured into Florida, especially Miami, attracted by the climate, the beaches, and the ease of travel from the chilly Northeast. Speculators bought land, any land, expecting its value to soar. Stories circulated of land that increased 1,500% in value over 10 years. Like stocks, land was bought with borrowed money. In 1926, the population influx slowed. The boom faltered, then collapsed when a hurricane slammed into Miami. By 1927, many Florida land speculators were facing bankruptcy. Agriculture, depression in the midst of prosperity. Prosperity never extended to most farmers, and farmers made up nearly 30% of the workforce in 1920. During the war, many farmers expanded operations in response to demands from abroad for food, and exports of farm products nearly quadrupled. After the war, European farmers resumed production, exports of farm products fell, and agricultural prices dropped. Throughout the 1920s, farmers consistently produced more than the domestic market could absorb, pushing prices down. We're talking about overproduction and underconsumption here, folks. The average farm's net income for the years 1917 and 1920 ranged between $1,196 and $1,395 in current dollars per year. Farm income fell to a dreadful $517 in 1921 and then slowly rose, but it never reached 1917 to 1920 levels until World War II. Farmers' net income never recovered to pre-war levels, but their mortgage payments more than doubled over pre-war levels, partly because many had borrowed to expand wartime production. Tax increases, purchases of tractors and trucks, now necessities on most farms, and the cost of fertilizer and other supplies bit further into farmers' meager earnings. Basically, it's more and more expensive to run a farm over time, and the crops they grow are getting less and less on the open market. As the farm economy deteriorated, the average value of an acre of farmland fell by more than half between 1920 and 1928. The average farm was actually less valuable in 1928 than it was in 1912. Thousands of farmer families left farming and moved to nearby towns or cities, and the percentage of farmers in the workforce fell from nearly 30 to less than 20. The 1920s were not the prosperity decade for rural America. The Roaring Twenties. Considering the questions, what groups most challenged traditional social patterns during the 1920s, and what role did technology play in social change during the 1920s? The world broke in two in 1922, or thereabouts, wrote novelist Willa Cather, and she didn't like what came after. F. Scott Fitzgerald, another novelist, agreed with the date, but believed 1922 marked the peak of the younger generation, who brought about the age of miracles, that is, he admitted, became an age of excess or that he admitted became an age of excess. Evidence of dramatic social change was easy to see from automobiles, radios, and movies to a new youth culture and, and an impressive cultural outpouring by African Americans. And most of these changes came in the burgeoning cities. A People on Wheels, The Automobile and American Life. The automobile profoundly changed Americans' lives. Highways significantly shortened the travel time from rural, from rural areas to cities, reducing the isolation of farm life. One farm woman, when asked by, why her family had an automobile but no indoor plumbing, responded, why you can't go to town in a bathtub. Trucks allowed farmers to take more products to market more quickly and conveniently. Tractors expanded the amount of land that a family could cultivate. By reducing the need for human labor, gasoline-powered farm vehicles stimulated migration to urban areas. The automobile profoundly changed city life, too. The 1920 census for the first time recorded more Americans living in urban areas, places having 2,500 people or more, than in rural ones. 
As automobiles freed suburbanites from, suburbanites from dependence on commuter rail lines, new suburbs mushroomed with most of the growth in single family houses. From 1922 to 1928, construction began on an average of 883,000 new homes each year. New home construction, nearly all in urban areas, rivaled the auto industry as a major driving force behind economic growth. However, the automobile soon demonstrated its ability to strangle urban traffic. In response, cities experimented with traffic lights. Various versions were tried, but Detroit's four-directional three-color model went out. Traffic lights spread rapidly to other large cities, but traffic congestion nonetheless worsened. By 1926, during the evening rush hour in Manhattan, cars crawled along at less than three miles per hour, slower than a person could walk, and many commuters returned to trains and subways. Los Angeles, automobile metropolis. Manhattan was not designed for automobile traffic, but the fastest growing major city of the era, Los Angeles, was. The population of LA increased tenfold between 1900 and 1920, then more than doubled by 1930, reaching 2.2 million. Expansion of citrus fruit ra raising, major oil discoveries, and the development of the motion picture industry laid an economic foundation for rapid population growth in Southern California. Manufacturing also expanded. During the 1920s, the city moved from 28th to 9th place among American cities based on manufacturing. Lack of sufficient water threatened to limit growth until city officials diverted the Owens River to LA through a 233 mile long aqueduct, aqueduct opened in 1913. Throughout the 1920s, Southern California promoters attracted many thousands of people with images of perpetual summer, tall palm trees lining wide boulevards filled with automobiles, fountains gushing water into the sunshine, and broad sandy beaches. LA boomed as the automobile industry advocated a car for every family and real estate developers pushed the single family home. By 1930, 94% of all LA residences were single family homes, an unprecedented level for a major city, giving LA the lowest urban population density of any major US city. Single family homes, by the way, are like the opposite of a multifamily home or a multifamily building, um, something like an apartment building, maybe a duplex, something like that. Life in LA came to be organized around the automobile. The first supermarket offering one-stop shopping appeared there and the Miracle Mile along Wilshire Boulevard was the first large shopping district designed for automobiles. The Los Angeles Times put it this way in 1926. Our forefathers in their immortal independence creeds uh, set forth the pursuit of happiness as an inalienable right of mankind. And how can one pursue happiness by any swifter and surer means than by the use of an automobile? By then, LA had one automobile for every three residents, twice the national average. Urban developers elsewhere now looked to LA for inspiration. A homogenized culture searches for heroes. LA was the capital of the movie industry. By the mid-1920s, towns of any size boasted at least one movie theater, and movie attendance increased from a weekly average of 40 million people in 1922 to 80 million in 1929, the equivalent of two-thirds of the total population. As Americans all across the country laughed or wept at the same movie, this new medium helped to homogenize the culture. That is, to make our culture more uniform by bridging regional or ethnic differences. Basically, these are going to be common experiences that all Americans get to share. Radio also contributed to greater homogeneity. The first commercial radio station began broadcasting in 1920. Within six years, 681 were operating. By 1930, 40% of all families had radios, including half of urban families. Other important factors in promoting more homogeneity included the automobile, which cut travel time, and new laws that sharply reduced immigration. Radio and film joined newspapers and magazines in creating and publicizing national trends and fashions as Americans pursued one fad after another. In 1924, crossword puzzles captured the attention of many Americans, and Contract Bridge, a card game, became the rage in 1926. Such fads created markets for new consumer goods, from crossword dictionaries to folding card tables. The media also helped to make spectator sports an obsession. Baseball had long been the preeminent national sport, and radio now broadcast baseball games nationwide. Other sports competed for fans' attention and dollars. Most Americans in the 1920s were familiar with the exploits of Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth on the a baseball diamond, Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney in boxing, and Bobby Jones, a golfer. Gertrude Adderley won national acclaim in 1926 when she became the first woman to swim the English Channel and did so faster than any previous man. The rapid spread of movie theaters created a new category of fame, the movie star. Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, and others brought laughter to the screen. Tom Mix was the most prominent movie cowboy. In addition to Clara Bow, sex made a star of Fida Bera, the, the vamp. Rudolph Valentino soared to fame as a male sex symbol and his most famous film, The Sheik, set in a fanciful Arabian desert. The greatest popular hero of the 1920s, however, was neither athlete nor actor, but a small town airmail pilot, Charles Lindbergh. Aviation then was barely out of its infancy. 
A few transatlantic flights had been logged by 1926, but the longest nonstop flight before 1927 was 2,500 miles from San Diego to New York. Lindbergh in 1927 set his sights on the $25,000 offered by a New York hotel owner for his first successful nonstop flight between New York and Paris, 3,500 miles. Lindbergh's plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, was a stripped down one engine craft. In a sleepless 33 and a half hour flight, during which he had nothing but ham and cheese sandwiches to eat, he earned the $25,000 and the adoration of crowds on both sides of the Atlantic. In an age devoted to materialism and dominated by a corporate mentality, Lindbergh's accomplishments suggested that old-fashioned individualism, courage, and self-reliance could still triumph over odds and adversity. By the way, if you're just listening to the audiobook, uh, make sure that you do refer to your text in order to see the images. There are several graphs, there are movie posters, there are pictures from back in the day that are really going to enhance your understanding of this decade, so make sure that you do uh, take a chance and look at those. Alienated intellectuals. Other Americans too went to Paris in the 1920s, but for different reasons than Lindbergh. These expatriates left the United States to escape what they considered America's intellectual shallowness, dull materialism, and spreading uniformity. As Malcolm Cowley put it in Exile's Return, 1934, his memoir of life in France, by expatriating himself, the artist can break the Puritan shackles, drink, live freely, and be wholly creative. Paris in the 1920s, he added, was a great machine for stimulating the nerves and sharpening the senses. Sinclair Lewis and H.L. Mencken became leading critics of middle-class materialism and uniformity without moving to Paris. Lewis, in Main Street, 1920, presented small-town middle-class existence as not just boring but also stifling. In Babbitt, 1922, Lewis depicted a suburban businessman, George Babbitt, as narrow-minded and complacent, speaking in cliches and buying every new gadget. H.L. Mencken, editor of the American Mercury, pilloried the boo-boo-zies, the Bourgeoisie, jeered at politicians, and celebrated only writers who shared his disdain for most of American life. Others added a, to added to the critique of modern life. In The Wasteland, 1922, T.S. Eliot, an American poet living in England, presented modernity as sterile and futile. F. Scott Fitzgerald in The Great Gatsby, 1925, portrayed the pointless lives of wealthy pleasure seekers and their careless disregard for life and values. Ernest Hemingway in The Sun Also Rises, 1926, depicted disillusioned and jaded expatriates. Renaissance among African Americans. For the most part, despair and disillusionment troubled white writers and intellectuals. Such sentiments rarely appeared in the striking outpouring of literature, music, and art by African Americans in the 1920s. As African Americans continued to move from the South to Northern cities, continuing the Great Migration, Harlem, the largest Black neighborhood in New York City, came to symbolize the new urban life of African Americans. The term Harlem Renaissance, or Negro Renaissance, refers to a literary and artistic movement in which Black artists and writers insisted on the value of Black culture and drew upon African and African-American traditions in their writing and art. Black actors, notably Paul Robeson, who was also a talented singer, appeared in serious theaters and earned acclaim for their abilities. Earlier Black writers, especially Alan Locke, James Weldon Johnson, and Claude McKee, encouraged and guided the novelists and poets of the Harlem Renaissance. Jean Toomer's novel Kane, 1923, dealing with African Americans in rural Georgia and Washington, D.C., has been praised as the most impressive product of the Negro Renaissance. Zora Neale Hurston began her long writing career with several short stories in the 1920s. Among the movement's poets, Langston Hughes became the best known. Born in Joplin, Missouri in 1902, Hughes began to write poetry in high school, briefly attended college, then worked and traveled in Africa and Europe. By 1925, he was a significant figure in the Harlem Renaissance. Some of his works present images from Black history, vividly depict racism, or look to the future with an expectation for change, as in I Too, 1925, I Too Sing America, I Am the Darker Brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and I eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll sit at the table when company comes. Hughes sometimes recited his poetry to the accompaniment of jazz, which became so prominent during the 1920s that the decade has been called the Jazz Age. African-American musicians in southern cities, especially New Orleans, developed jazz in the early 20th century, drawing from earlier strains in African-American music, particularly the blues and ragtime. Jazz moved north by the 1910s. Some attacked the new sound, claiming it encouraged people to abandon self-restraint, especially with regard to sex. Despite, or perhaps because of, such condemnation, the wail of the saxophone became as much a part of the 1920s as the roar of the roadster and the flicker of the movie projector. The great Black jazz musicians of the 1920s, Louis Sachmo Armstrong, Bessie Smith, Fletcher Henderson, Ferdinand Jelly Roll Morton, and others, drew white audiences into Black neighborhoods to hear them. Harlem came to be associated with exotic nightlife and glittering jazz clubs. 
Edward Duke Ellington came to lead the Cotton Club Band in 1927 and began to develop the works that made him one of America's most respected composers. George Gershwin, a white composer, brought jazz into the symphony halls with his Rhapsody in Blue, 1924. Few African Americans experienced the glitter of the Cotton Club, but one Harlem Black leader influenced many Black people throughout the country and beyond. Marcus Garvey, born in Jamaica, advocated a form of Black separatism. Black separatism, by the way, is defined as a strategy of creating separate Black institutions based on the assumption that African Americans can never achieve equality within white society. Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, or UNIA, founded in 1914, stressed racial pride, the importance of Africa, and racial solidarity across national boundaries. Garvey supported Garvey's supporters urged Blacks around the world to help Africans overthrow colonial rule and build a strong Africa. Garvey's message of racial pride and solidarity attracted wide support among African Americans, especially in the cities. Black integrationist leaders, especially W.E.B. Du Bois of the NAACP, opposed Garvey's separatism and argued that the first task facing Blacks was integration and equality at home. Garvey and Du Bois each labeled the other one a traitor to his race. Garvey was convicted of mail fraud in 1923 due to irregularities in his fundraising. After two years in jail, he was deported to his native Jamaica. Flaming Youth African Americans created jazz, but those who danced to it in the popular imagination were white, a male college student clad in a stylish raccoon skin coat with a flask of illegal liquor in his pocket, and his female counterpart, the uninhibited flapper, with bobbed hair and a daringly short skirt. This stereotype of flaming youth, the title of a popular novel, reflected changes among many white urban youths of middle or upper class background. In the 1920s, adolescence emerged as a separate subculture. The booming economy allowed more urban middle class families to send over their children to college or send their children to college. Before World War I, just over 3% of people aged 18 to 24 were in college. By 1930, that proportion had more than doubled with larger increases among women. Now women were receiving 40% of all bachelor's degrees. Students reshaped colleges and youth centers where football games and dances assumed as much significance as examinations and term papers. Young women who kept public attention with their clothes and behavior were called flappers. They scandalized their elders with skirts that stopped at the knee, stockings rolled below the knee, short hair often dyed black, and generous amounts of rouge and lipstick. Rouge, by the way, is an old-timey word for blush. Many observers assumed that their outrageous looks reflected outrageous behavior, that young women were abandoning their parents' as moral values. In fact, women's sexual activity outside marriage began to increase well before the war, especially among working class women and radicals. Dating, too, owed its origin to pre-war working class young people. In the 1920s, these behaviors appeared among college and high school students from middle class families. About half the women who came of age during the 1920s had intercourse before marriage, a marked increase from pre-war patterns. Such changes were often linked to automobiles. Automobiles brought greater freedom to young people, for there they had no chaperone and could go where they wanted. Sometimes they went to a speakeasy where illegal alcohol was sold. Before prohibition, few women entered saloons, but now while men and women alike went to speakeasies to drink, smoke, and dance to jazz. Some adults criticized such behavior by young people, but others emulated them, launching the first American youth culture. F. Scott Fitzgerald later called the years after 1922 a children's party taken over by the elders. Traditional America roars back. Considering the question, why and how did some Americans try to restore traditional social values during the 1920s? Many Americans embraced cars, movies, jazz, and radios, but others felt threatened by the pace of change and what seemed to be an upheaval in social values. In nearly every case, efforts to stop the tide of change appeared in both cities and rural areas, and many of those efforts dated to the pre-war era. In the 1920s, several movements seeking to restore elements of an older America came to fruition at the same time as Fitzgerald's, Fitzgerald's Age of Ex Excess. Toward a more perfect union, the 18th and 19th Amendments. The 18th and 19th Amendments took effect in 1920. Both marked the culmination of decades-long advocacy and both benefited significantly from women's political activism. The 18th Amendment, or prohibition, is unlike other amendments. First, prohibition was designed to change Americans' behavior by prohibiting the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors. Other amendments have changed political procedures, specified individual rights, or defined governmental authority. No other amendments have attempted to modify individuals' behavior. Second, prohibition is the only amendment ever repealed, testimony to its failure and a warning against using constitutional amendments to modify social behavior. The 19th Amendment, women's suffrage, took effect in time for women to participate in the 1920 elections, but most women did not vote. Analysis by recent political scientists suggests that outside the South, very few people voted in the South. About 25 to 40 percent of eligible women voted in 1920, and that the proportion of women who voted was significantly and consistently lower than that of men. Not until 1980 did women's turnout rate exceed that of men. 
But since 1980, the gap between women's and men's voting participation rates has steadily widened. In both 2008 and 2012, 53% of eligible women actually voted compared to 47% of eligible men. Prohibition. The 18th Amendment prohibition came to symbolize many of the efforts to preserve white old stock Protestant values. Prohibition did reduce drinking somewhat, but many Americans simply ignored it. It grew less popular the longer it lasted. By 1926, a poll indicated that only 19% of Americans supported prohibition, 50% wanted it modified, and 31% favored outright repeal. Prohibition, however, remained the law, if not the reality, from 1920 until 1933, when the 21st Amendment finally did repeal it. Prohibition was never well enforced anywhere, partly because of the immensity of the task and partly because Congress never provided enough money for serious federal enforcement. In 1923, a federal agent visited major cities to see how long it took to find an illegal drink. It took him 35 seconds in New Orleans, 3 minutes in Detroit, and 3 minutes and 10 seconds in New York City. Previously, neighborhood saloons had often attracted working class and lower middle class men, but the new speakeasies were often more glamorous, drawing an upper and middle class clientele, women as well as men. Bootlegging, meaning production and sale of illegal beverages, flourished. Some bootleggers made only small amounts of beer or wine and sold it to their neighbors. Large-scale bootlegging, however, provided criminals with a fresh and lucrative source of income, part of which could buy influence in city politics and protection from police. In Chicago, Al Capone's gang counted nearly a thousand members and in 1927 took in more than a hundred million dollars, which is equivalent to 1.3 billion with a B dollars today. 60 million bucks of that, by the way, was from bootlegged liquor. Capone faced competition from other gangs, and gang warfare raged across Chicago, producing some 500 slings. In 1931, federal officials finally convicted Capone of income tax evasion and sent him to prison. In other cities, other gangsters, many of recent immigrant background, including Italians, Irish, Germans, and Jews, also found riches in bootlegging, gambling, prostitution, and racketeering. Through racketeering, they gained power in some labor unions. The gangs, killings, and corruption confirmed other Americans' distrust of cities and immigrants, and they clung to the vision of a dry America as the best hope for renewing traditional values. Fundamentalism and the Campaign Against Evolution Fundamentalism, a movement within Protestant Christianity, represented another effort to maintain traditional values. Where Christian modernists tried to reconcile their religious beliefs with modern science, fundamentalists rejected anything, including science, that they considered incompatible with the scriptures. Every word of the Bible, they argued, is the revealed word of God. Calling for a return to the simplicity of old-time religion, the fundamentalist movement grew, uh, grew throughout the early 20th century, led by such figures as Billy Sunday, a baseball player turned evangelist. By the 1920s, Amy Semple McPherson had become one of the most influential fundamentalists. She arrived in Southern California in 1918, and by 1922, she had organized her four-square gospel church in Los Angeles. In her immense Angelus temple, she preached in white robes, staged spectacular performances complete with a full orchestra that sometimes played jazz, and drew thousands of enthusiastic converts to her version of fundamentalist Protestantism. She was also a pioneer of the use of radio. She's sort of like the grandma of televangelism in a sense. In the early 1920s, some fundamentalists focused on evolution. Biologists cite evolution to explain how living things developed over millions of years. Because the Bible states that God created the world and all living things in six days, fundamentalists saw in evolution a challenge both to the Bible and to religion itself. William Jennings Bryan, former Democratic presidential candidate and Secretary of State, fixed on the evolution controversy after 1920. His energy, eloquence, and enormous following guaranteed that his arguments received wide attention. It is better, Bryan wrote, to trust in the rock of ages than to know the age of rocks. Brian played a central role in the most famous dispute over evolution, the Scopes Trial, also known as the Scopes Monkey Trial. In March 1925, the Tennessee legislature made it illegal for public school teachers to teach evolution. The American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, offered to defend a teacher willing to challenge the law, and John T. Scopes, who taught biology in Dayton, he was a sub when he did it, by the way, accepted. Brian volunteered to assist the local prosecutors, who faced a defense team that included the famous attorney Clarence Darrow. Brian claimed that the only issue was the right of the people to regulate public education, but Darrow insisted the issue was to prevent ignoramuses from controlling the education of the United States. The court proceedings were carried nationwide via radio. Toward the end of the trial, in a surprising move, Darrow called Brian to the witness stand as an authority on the Bible. Under Darrow's withering questioning, Brian revealed that he knew little about findings in archaeology, geology, and linguistics that cast doubt on biblical accounts. He also admitted to the dismay of many fundamentalists that he did not always interpret the words of the Bible literally. Darrow never spared him, one reporter wrote. It was masterful, but it was pitiful. Brian died a few days later. Scopes was found guilty, but the Tennessee Supreme Court reversed his sentence on a technicality. 
Nativism, Immigration, Restriction, and Eugenics. Throughout the 1920s, nativism and discrimination were widespread. Restrictive covenants attached to real estate titles prohibited future sale to particular groups, typically African Americans and Jews, and in the West to Asian Americans. Exclusive colleges placed quotas on the number of Jews admitted, and some companies refused to hire Jews. In 1920, Henry Ford accused Jewish bankers of controlling the American economy, then suggested an international Jewish conspiracy to control virtually everything from baseball to Bolshevism. When Aaron Sapiro sued Ford for defamation and challenged him to prove his claims, Ford retracted his charges and apologized. Ethnic hostility sometimes turned violent, as when rioting townspeople beat and stoned Italians in West Frankfort, Illinois in 1920. Laws to restrict immigration resulted in significant part from nativist anxieties that immigrants, especially from Southern and Eastern Europe, were transforming the United States. Advocates of restriction redoubled their efforts in response to an upsurge in immigration after the war, 43,000 in 1920 and 805,000 in 1921, with more than half of them from Southern and Eastern Europe. Efforts to cut off immigration were not new. However, the presence of many German Americans during the war with Germany, the Red Scare and fear of foreign radicalism, and the continued influx of poor immigrants at a time of growing unemployment bolstered, means, uh, meaning strengthened, nativist arguments. Congress limited immigration with a temporary measure in 1921, then it proved a permanent law in 1924, the National Origins Act, restricting total immigration to 150,000 per year. Make sure you definitely know the National Origins Act. A. Bush loves to ask about that. It's a really, really, really big deal in, uh, in immigration history. Quotas for each country were set at 2% of the number of Americans whose ancestors came from that country. In attempting to freeze the ethnic composition of the nation, the law reflected the arguments of those nativists who contended that immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe and Asia made less desirable citizens than people from Northern and Western Europe. All Asians were excluded, but the law permitted unrestricted immigration from Canada and Latin America. And it's important real fast to go back and note that the quotas for each country that were set at 2% of the number of Americans whose ancestors came from that country, they didn't take 2% of the population in 1924, they took 2% of the population in 1890, which is just a further restriction on the number of Southern and Eastern immigrants who they're going to let in, because very few Southern and Eastern, Eastern immigrants were coming in 1890, they, they really came after that in bigger numbers. It matters today, teaching evolution in public schools. After the Scopes trial, other state legislatures also prohibited the teaching of evolution. Textbook publishers diluted or omitted treatment of evolution. Not until the 1950s, when national science education standards were developed, did a thorough treatment of evolution return to most high school textbooks. In 1968, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned a 1928 Arkansas law prohibiting the teaching of evolution because it reflected the views of a particular religious group that considered evolution to be in conflict with the Bible, and therefore violated the First Amendment, which prohibits Congress from adopting any law that privileges one religious group and the 14th Amendment, which applies the First Amendment to state governments. Opponents of evolution then secured laws requiring teaching creationism. This, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down in 1987 in the case involving a Louisiana law. Since then, opponents of evolution have often used the term intelligent design. That issue continues to be hotly debated in several states. If you want, you can uh, do this. You can search online newspapers to find examples of recent controversies over the teaching of evolution. What are the arguments? And William Jennings Bryan argued in part that in a democracy, elected officials should control the content of courses in public schools. Should course content be determined by elected officials or by specialists in each discipline? In its transparent effort to restrict immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe, while admitting larger numbers from Northern and Western Europe, the National Origins Act also reflects the concern of some eugenics advocates. Eugenics, by the way, is the notion that genetic information should be used to improve the human race. The eugenics movement developed in the late 19th and early 20th century. Its proponents hoped to apply genetics to improve the human race. Some eugenicists argued that Southern and Eastern Europeans showed undesirable genetic traits and advocated excluding them. Other eugenicists focused on mental ability or mental illness to argue that those with undesirable traits should be sterilized. In 1927, the U.S. Supreme Court approved a Virginia law permitting the state to sterilize those considered mentally retarded. Such state laws were widespread by the 1920s and most continued in force until the 1960s. The Ku Klux Klan. Nativism, anti-Catholicism, anti-Semitism, and fear of radicalism all contributed to the spectacular growth of the Ku Klux Klan in the early 1920s. The original Klan, created during Reconstruction to intimidate former slaves, had long since died out. A hugely popular film, The Birth of a Nation, released in 1915, glorified the old Klan and led to its revival. The new Klan claimed to be devoted to traditional American values, old-fashioned Protestant Christianity, and white supremacy. It opposed Catholics, Jews, immigrants, and Blacks, along with bootleggers, corrupt politicians, and gamblers. Growth came slowly at first, but surged to 5 million members nationwide by 1925. 
The plan showed strength in the South, Midwest, West, and Southwest, and in towns and cities as well as rural areas. Clan members participated actively in politics, and clan leaders gained powerful political influence in some communities and states, notably Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Oregon, and Indiana. I would also add Colorado to that list. In Oklahoma, the Klan led a successful impeachment campaign against a governor who tried to restrict it. In Oregon, the Klan claimed responsibility for a 1922 law aimed at eliminating Catholic schools. The Supreme Court ruled the law unconstitutional. Many local and state elections in 1924 divided along pro and anti-Klan lines. Extensive corruption underlay the Klan's self-righteous rhetoric. Some Klan leaders joined primarily for personal gain, both legal from recruiting and illegal, mostly political payoffs. Some shamelessly violated the morality that they preached. In 1925, D.C. Stevenson, a nationally prominent Klan leader, was convicted of second-degree murder after the death of a woman who had accused him of raping her. When the governor refused to pardon him, Stevenson produced records proving the corruption of the governor of Indiana, a member of Congress, the mayor of Indianapolis, and other officials. Klan membership fell sharply amid factional disputes and further evidence of fraud and corruption. New social patterns in the 1920s, considering the three questions, what continuities and changes characterized racial and ethnic relations during the 1920s? Is it appropriate to describe the 1920s as the lean years for working people? And how did gender roles and definitions change in the 1920s? The Harlem Renaissance and Klan Night Riders represented polar extremes of racial relations in the 1920s. For most people of color, the realities of daily life fell somewhere in between. For working people, the 1920s represented what one historian terms the lean years when earlier gains were lost and unions remained on the defensive. For women, the 1920s opened with the victory of suffrage, but the unity mustered for that measure soon broke down. Ethnicity and race, North, South, and West. Discrimination against Jews, violence against Italians, and the Klan's appeal to white Protestants all point to the continuing significance of ethnicity during the 1920s. Throughout the decade, racial relations remained deeply troubled at best, violent at worst. The Harlem Renaissance helped to produce greater appreciation for Black music and other accomplishments, but racial discrimination still confronted most African Americans wherever they lived. Some gained better jobs by moving to cities in the North or West, but many found work only in low-paying service occupations. Nearly everywhere, social pressures and restrictive covenants limited access to desirable housing. Those who succeeded sometimes became targets for racial hostility, like the Black physician whose home was attacked by a white mob when he moved into a white Detroit neighborhood in 1925. A race riot devastated Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, leaving nearly 40 confirmed dead. Black deaths outnumbered white by more than two to one. Hundreds injured and 1,400 black businesses and homes burned. The NAACP continued to lobby for a federal anti-lynching law by publicizing violence against blacks, but Southern legislators defeated each attempt, arguing against federal interference in the police power of the states. East of the Mississippi River, whether north or south, race relations usually meant black and white relations. In the West, race relations were always more complex and became more so in the years around World War I, when Filipinos began to arrive in Hawaii and on the West Coast. Many of them worked in agriculture and aboard ships. Sikhs from India also entered the West Coast workforce, mainly as agricultural laborers. California had long led the way with laws discriminating against Asian Americans. By the 1920s, other Western states also adopted laws forbidding Asian immigrants to own or to lease land. Westerners, especially Californians, also had a lengthy record of violence against Asians. In 1930, for example, a white mob killed a Filipino farm worker in Watsonville, California. Some Asian immigrants and Asian Americans fought discrimination throughout the court or through the courts, but with little success. In the early 1920s, the U.S. Supreme Court reaffirmed that only white persons and persons of African descent could become naturalized citizens, denying citizenship to persons born in Asia. The Supreme Court also ruled that Mississippi could require a Chinese American school child to attend a segregated school established for African Americans. Beginnings of change in federal Indian policy. During the 1920s, events began to converge in support of changes in federal policy toward American Indians. In the early 1920s, Interior Secretary Albert Fall tried to lease parts of reservations to white developers and to extinguish Pueblo Indians' title to some of their land. Fall's proposals, especially the Pueblo land issue, led to organization by John Collier, a social worker of the American Indian Defense Association, the AIDA, in 1923. Collier and the AIDA soon emerged as prominent advocates for changes in federal Indian policy. They sought better health and educational services on reservations, creation of tribal governments, tolerance of Indian religious ceremonies and other customs, and an end to land allotments. Changes intended to move toward a policy of recognizing Indian cultures and values rather than a policy that forced assimilation. Political pressure by AIDA and similar groups, along with political efforts by Indians themselves, secured several favorable new laws, including full citizenship for all Native Americans. These efforts laid the basis for a significant shift in federal policy in the 1930s. Mexican-Americans. 
California and the Southwest have been home to many Mexican and Mexican-American families since the region was part of Mexico. Those states, especially Texas and California, attracted growing numbers of Mexican immigrants after 1910, when many went north to escape the revolution and civil war that was devastating their nation. Nearly 700,000 Mexicans legally entered the U.S. between 1910 and 1930, and probably the same number came illegally. Smaller numbers of Latinos came from Central America. The agricultural economies of the Southwest were changing. By 1925, the Southwest was relying on irrigation to produce 40% of the nation's fruits and vegetables, crops that were highly labor intensive. By the late 1920s, Mexicans made up more than 80% of farm laborers there. The Southwestern states also experienced large increases in their Anglo populations. These changes in population and economy reshaped relations between Anglos and Mexicans. In South Texas, many Anglo newcomers looked on Mexicans as what one Anglo called a partly colored race and tried to import elements of Southern Black-White relations, including disenfranchisement and segregation. Disenfranchisement, meaning to strip them of the right to vote, was unsuccessful, but some schools were segregated despite Mexican opposition. The League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, could sometimes halt discrimination by businesses, but only occasionally. LULAC, by the way, is still around. In California, Mexican workers' efforts to organize for better pay and working conditions were often broken quickly and brutally by local authorities or growers as private guards. Leaders were often deported. Mexican labor had become vital to agriculture, however, and growers opposed any restrictions on immigration from Mexico, so the National Origins Act of 1924 had permitted um, unlimited immigration from the Western Hemisphere. As the doors to European immigration closed with the new immigration law, Midwestern manufacturers began to recruit Mexican workers to work in steel mills, meatpacking plants, and auto factories. By 1930, significant numbers of Mexican Americans were to be found in such industrial cities as Chicago, Detroit, and Gary. Labor on the defensive. Difficulties in establishing unions among Mexican workers mirrored a larger failure of unions in the 1920s. When unions tried to recover lost purchasing power by calling strikes in 1919 and 1920, nearly all failed. After 1921, employers increasingly challenged the, uh, the progressive era legislation benefiting workers. The Supreme Court responded by limiting workers' rights via voiding laws that prohibited child labor and striking down minimum wage laws. Many companies undertook anti-union drives. Arguing that unions were unnecessary and either corrupt or radical, some employers used the term American plan to describe their refusal to deal with unions. American plans, by the way, are defined as term used by some employers in the 1920s to describe their policy of refusing to negotiate with unions. Some companies began to provide workers with programs such as insurance, retirement pensions, cafeterias, paid vacations, and stock purchase plans, an approach sometimes called welfare capitalism. Such innovations stemmed from both genuine concern for workers' well-being and the expectation that such improvements would increase productivity and discourage unionization. The idea is that if the business is taking care of you and giving you things that a union might otherwise give you, that you're not going to have a need to go, you know, toward a union in the first place. The 1920s marked the first period of prosperity since the 1830s when union membership declined, falling from 5 million in 1920 to 3.6 million in 1929, a 28% decline at a time when the total workforce increased by 15%. AFL leaders, insisting on separate unions for each skill group, made no effort to organize uh, the great mass production industries. Some union, unions suffered from internal battles. The International Ladies Garment Workers Union lost two-thirds of its members during power struggles between socialists and communists. The communists sought power within other unions, but the membership of the Communist Party of the United States, the CP, never approached the numbers claimed by the Socialist Party before World War I. In 1929, the CP counted only 9,300 members. Always closely tied to the leadership of the Soviet Union, the CP labored strenuously to organize workers throughout the 1920s, but had little success. Changes in Women's Lives Attention given to flappers should not detract from important changes in women's gender roles during these years. Significant changes occurred in two areas, family and politics. Marriage among white middle-class women and men began to be valued increasingly as companionship between two partners. Although the ideal of marriage was often expressed in terms of a man and woman taking equal responsibility for a relationship, the actual responsibility for the smooth functioning of, of the family typically fell on the woman. Many women of the 1920s seem to have increased their control over decisions about childbearing. Usually in American history, prosperity brings increases in the birth rate. In the 1920s, however, changing social values together with more options for birth control resulted in fewer births. This declining birth rate reflected in part some success for efforts to secure wider availability of birth control information and devices, for example, diaphragms. The birth control movement gained the backing of some male physicians and became a more respectable middle-class reform movement. By 1925, the American Medical Association had come to a, a support birth control and the Rockefeller Foundation began to fund medical research into contraception methods. 
Nevertheless, until 1936, federal law restricted public distribution of contraceptive information and many women still relied on illegal abortions to terminate unwanted pregnancies. In Clara Bow's Hollywood, abortions became almost routine as a way for actresses to meet their contractual obligations to perform in films and to avoid public scandal. As before, working class women struggled to stretch their finances to cover their families' needs. As before, some women and children worked outside the home to earn additional family income. The proportion of women working for wages remained stable during the 1920s at about one in four. The proportion of married women working for wages increased though from 23% of the female labor force in 1920 to 29% in 1930. After the implementation of the 19th Amendment Women's Suffrage in 1920, the unity of the suffrage movement disintegrated in disputes over the proper role for women voters. Both major political parties welcomed women as voters and modified the structure of their national committees to provide that each state be represented by both a national committee man and a national committee woman. Some suffrage activists joined the League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan group committed to social and political reform. The Congressional Union, led by Alice Paul, converted itself into the National Women's Party and, after 1923, focused its efforts on securing an Equal Rights Amendment, or the ERA, to the Constitution. The League of Women Voters disagreed, arguing that such an amendment would endanger laws providing protection for women. Their concern there is that equality means that protections the women specifically need would no longer be legal, so they want to keep some of those protections on the books, whereas supporters of the ERA would, would really prefer for those laws not to get in the way of full legal, social, and political equality. There is, by the way, um, a section, a deeper understanding of history using statistics to, and historical analysis that's on page 586. That's a really good thing to actually read and look at yourself. I'm not going to include that in this audiobook because describing and reading these stats out loud isn't quite, I think, going to, to be, um, it's not going to be easy for you to comprehend it. So I would recommend reading that in the book. Development of gay and lesbian subcultures. In the 1920s, gay and lesbian subcultures became more established and relatively open in several cities. The Captive, a play about lesbians, opened in New York in 1926, and some movies included unmistakable homosexual references. Novels with gay and lesbian characters were published in the late 1920s and early 1930s. In Chicago, the Society for Human Rights was organized to advocate equal treatment. A relatively open gay and lesbian community emerged in Harlem, where some prominent figures of the Renaissance were gay or bisexual. The annual Hamilton Lodge Drag Ball in Harlem attracted as many as 7,000 revelers and spectators of all races. At the same time, however, more and more psychiatrists and psychologists were labeling homosexuality a perversion. Perversion, by the way, is a sexual practice considered abnormal or deviant. By the 1920s, the work of Sigmund Freud had become well known. Following Freud, psychiatrists and psychologists now labeled homosexuality a sexual disorder requiring a cure, though no cure proved viable. Thus, Freud's theories may have been liberating for heterosexual relations, but they proved harmful for same-sex relations. The new medical definitions were slow to work their way into the larger society. The armed forces, for example, made little effort to prevent homosexuals from enlisting and took disciplinary action only against such behavior that violated laws against sodomy. The late 1920s and early 1930s brought increased suppression of gays and lesbians. New state laws gave police greater authority to prosecute open expressions of homosexuality. Adam Clayton Powell, a leading Harlem minister, launched a highly publicized campaign against gays. Motion Picture Studios instituted a morality code that, among its wide-ranging provisions, prohibited any depiction of homosexuality. The end of Prohibition after 1933 brought increased regulation of businesses selling liquor, and local authorities often used that power to close establishments with gay or lesbian customers. Thus, by the 1930s, life was becoming more difficult for many gays and lesbians. The politics of prosperity, considering the questions, compare the economic policies of the Harding and Coolidge administrations with those of the Roosevelt and Wilson administrations, and compare La Follette's campaign in 1924 with those of Roosevelt in 1912 and the populists in 1892. Sooner or later, the major social and economic developments of the 1920s found their way into politics, from highway construction to prohibition, from immigration restriction to the teaching of evolution, from farm prices to lynching. After 1918, the Republicans regained the national majority they had held from 1894 to 1912, and they remained the unquestioned majority throughout the 1920s. Basically, the Republicans have the most political power during the 1920s, not only the presidency, but also in other ways. Progressivism largely disappeared, though some veteran progressives led by Robert La Follette and George Norris persisted in seeking to limit corporate power. The Republican administrations of the 1920s shared a faith in the ability of business to establish prosperity and benefit the American people and considered government the partner of business, not its regulator. Harding's failed presidency. Elected in 1920, Warren G. Harding looked presidential, handsome, gray-haired, dignified, warm, outgoing, but he had little depth. 
he wasn't very bright. For some appointments, he chose the most respected leaders of his party, including Charles Evans Hughes for Secretary of State, Andrew Mellon for Secretary of the Treasury, and Herbert Hoover for Secretary of Commerce. Harding, however, was the most comfortable play, was most comfortable playing poker with his friends, and he gave many government jobs to his cronies and political supporters. They made his administration one of the most corrupt in American history. As their misdeeds came to light, Harding put off taking action against them. Returning from a trip in Alaska, to Alaska, he died on August 2nd, 1923, probably from a burst blood vessel in his brain. The full extent of corruption became clear after Harding's death. Albert Fall, Secretary of the Interior, had accepted huge bribes from oil companies for leases on federal oil reserves at Elk Hills, California and Teapot Dome, Wyoming. Attorney General Harry Doherty and others pocketed payoffs to approve the sale of government-held property below its value. Doherty may also have protected bootleggers. The head of the Veterans Bureau defrauded the government of more than $200 million. In all, three cabinet members resigned, four officials went to jail, and five men committed suicide. As if the corruption were not enough, in 1927, Nan Britton published a book claiming she had been Harding's mistress, had borne his child, a claim that has since been confirmed by DNA evidence and testing, and had carried on trysts with him in the White House. Oh, scandalous. By the way, Teapot Dome is something you should definitely know. Um, the Teapot Dome scandal is also depicted in a political cartoon here on page 588. As these scandals unfolded, hard-pressed farmers turned to the federal government for help. In 1921, farm organizations worked with senators and representatives to form a bipartisan farm bloc to support legislation that would assist farmers. In the 1922 elections, distraught farmers across the Midwest turned out conservatives and elected candidates attuned to farmers' problems. Congress passed a few assistance measures in the early 1920s, but none addressed the central problems of overproduction and low prices. By 1922, some farm organizations joined with unions, especially unions of railroad workers, to form the Confederate Conference for Progressive Political Action and agitate for a new progressive party. The three candidate presidential election of 1924. When Harding died, Vice President Calvin Coolidge became president. Fortunately for Republicans, Coolidge exemplified honesty, virtue, and sobriety. In 1924, Republicans quickly chose him as their candidate for president. The Democratic Convention, however, sank into a long and bitter deadlock. The party had long divided between Southerners, mostly Protestant and committed to white supremacy, and Northerners, often city dwellers and of recent immigrant descent, um, including many Catholics. In 1924, the Klan was approaching its peak membership and exercised significant influence among many Democratic delegates from the South and parts of the Midwest. Many Northern Democrats wanted to nominate Al Smith for president. Highly popular as governor of New York, Smith epitomized urban immigrant America. Catholic and the son of immigrants, he was everything that the KKK and most of the Southern Convention delegates opposed. After nine hot days of deadlock and 103 ballots, the exhausted Democrats uh, turned to a virtually unknown compromise candidate, John W. Davis, who had served in the Wilson administration then become a corporate lawyer. All in all, the convention seemed to confirm the observation by the contemporary humorist Will Rogers, I belong to no organized political party, I am a Democrat. Surviving progressives welcomed the independent candidacy of Senator Robert M. LaFollette, nominated by a new progressive party formed by farmers, unions, and reformers. The LaFollette progressives attacked big business and promoted collective bargaining, reform of politics, public ownership of railroads and water power, and a public referendum on the questions of war and peace. LaFollette was the first presidential candidate to be endorsed by the American Federation of Labor. Republican campaigners largely ignored Davis and focused on portraying LaFollette as a dangerous radical. Coolidge claimed the key issue was whether America will allow itself to be degraded into a communistic or socialistic state, or remain American. Coolidge won with nearly 16 million votes and 54% of the total. Davis held on to many traditional Democratic voters, especially in the South, receiving 8 million votes and 29%. LaFollette carried only his home state of Wisconsin, but he garnered almost 5 million votes at 17% and did well in urban working class neighborhoods and in parts of the Midwest and West. The Politics of Business Committed to limited government, Coolidge tried to reduce the significance of the presidency, and he succeeded. He announced that the business of America is business, and he believed that the free market would best sustain economic prosperity for all. As president, he set out to prevent government from interfering with business. He really is going to be a continuation of his predecessor in many ways. Um, Harding, when he got an office, remember his slogan was, you know, a return to normalcy, getting America back to normal, whatever that might mean, you know, stopping the churning of progressivism. And Coolidge is going to be a continuation of those same ideas. Coolidge had little sympathy for efforts to secure federal help for the faltering farm economy. Congress tried to resolve the problems of low prices for farm products and persistent agricultural surpluses with the McNary Hagen Bill, which would have created federal price supports and authorized the government to buy farm surpluses and to sell them abroad. 
The farm bloc pushed the bill through Congress in 1927, but Coolidge vetoed it. The same thing happened in 1928. In contrast, the Railway Labor Act of 1926 drew on wartime experiences to establish collective bargaining for railroad employees. Passed by overwhelming margins in Congress, the new law met most of the railway union's demands and effectively removed them from politics. Andrew Mellon, one of the wealthiest men in the nation, served as Secretary of the Treasury throughout the 1920s. Arguing that high taxes on the wealthy stifled the economy, he secured tax breaks for the affluent, affluent, the rich, claiming they would benefit everyone through productive investments of the tax savings. The result, however, was greater income inequality. Herbert Hoover, Secretary of Commerce under Harding and Coolidge, urged Coolidge to regulate the increasingly wild use of credit, which contributed to rampant stock market speculation, but Coolidge refused. Coolidge cut federal spending and staffed federal agencies with people who shared his distaste for too much government. Unlike Harding, Coolidge found honest and competent appointees, um, putting pro-business figures into regulatory commissions and naming conservative pro-business judges to the courts. The Wall Street Journal described the outcome. Never before, here or anywhere else, has a government been so completely fused with business. The 1928 campaign and the election of Hoover. In August of 1927, President Coolidge announced, I do not choose to run in 1928, stunning the country and his party. Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover immediately declared his candidacy, and Republicans um, found him an ideal candidate, representing what most Americans believed was best about the U.S., individual effort, and honestly earned success. Son of a Quaker blacksmith from Iowa, Hoover was orphaned at 10 and grew up believing that hard work was the only way to success. After graduating from Stanford University, he traveled the world as a mining engineer and became a millionaire. When World War I broke out, he returned to public service, organizing relief for Belgium. When the U.S. entered the war, President Wilson named Hoover to head the U.S. Food Administration. By the end of the war, Hoover had become an international hero. As Secretary of Commerce under Harding and Coolidge, he attracted wide support in the business community for his efforts to encourage economic growth through associationalism. Yeah, associationalism. Can't believe that I pronounced that right the first time. Voluntary cooperation among otherwise competing groups. In launching his campaign before thousands of supporters gathered in the Stanford football stadium, Hoover sounded the theme of his candidacy. We in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before. That's ironic because he's president when the Great Depression starts. The Democrats nominated Al Smith. Like Hoover, he was a self-made man. Unlike Hoover, who had gone to Stanford, Smith's education came from the streets of New York City and from Tammany Hall, the city's dominant democratic political machine. As a reform-minded progressive governor of New York, Smith streamlined state government, improved its efficiency, and supported legislation to set a minimum wage and maximum hours of work and to establish state ownership of hydroelectric plants. Smith became the main issue in the campaign. Opponents attacked his Catholic religion, his big city background, his opposition to prohibition, his Tammany connections, and even his New York accent. Anti-Catholic sentiment burned hotly in parts of the country, fanned by remnants of the Klan. Evangelist Billy Sunday called Smith's supporters damnable whiskey politicians, bootleggers, crooks, pimps, and businessmen who deal with them. Thus, for many voters, the choice seemed to be between a candidate who represented hard work and the pious, value, pious values of small-town old-stock Protestant America, and a candidate who represented Catholics, foreigners, machine politics, and the problems of the cities. Hoover won easily with 58%. Prosperity and the nation's long-term Republican majority probably would have spelled victory for any competent Republican. Smith's religion and anti-prohibition stance cost in the South where Hoover carried areas that had not voted Republican since Reconstruction. Smith brought some Democratic gains in Northern cities, partly by drawing to the polls Catholic voters, especially women who had not previously voted. The first president born west of the Mississippi River, Hoover came to the presidency with definite ideas about both dom domestic and foreign policy. He set out to be an active president. The role of government, he believed, was to promote cooperation. He warned that once government, especially the federal government, stepped in to solve problems directly, the people gave up some of their freedom and government became part of the problem. Hoover recognized that the federal government had a responsibility to help find solutions to social and economic problems, but the key word was help. Hoover looked to the government to help but not to solve problems by itself. The Diplomacy of Prosperity, considering the questions, what role did the U.S. play in world affairs during the 1920s, and how successful was Hughes at the Washington Naval Conference? Two realities shaped American foreign policy in the 1920s, rejection of Woodrow Wilson's internationalism and a continuing quest by American business for more markets and investments. As president, Harding dismissed any American role in the League of Nations and refused to accept the Treaty of Versailles. Undamaged by the war, American firms outproduced and outtraded the rest of the world. U.S. trade accounted for 30% of the world's total and American firms produced more than 70% of the world's oil and almost 50% of the world's coal and steel. American bankers loaned billions of dollars outside the United States. With neither expertise nor interest in foreign affairs, Harding and Coolidge left most foreign policy decisions to their secretaries of state, Charles Evans Hughes and Frank Kellogg. 
Both very capable, they sought to expand American influence in business abroad through what historians have called independent internationalism. Independent or unilateral, meaning just one-sided, one country, it would be opposed to bilateral or multilateral. Uh, independent or unilateral internationalism had two central thrusts, avoidance of multilateral commitments, sometimes called isolationism, and expansion of economic opportunities overseas. Basically, we want to make sure that we're the only ones making choices, we're doing stuff by ourselves, and we're also promoting business. The Commerce and State Departments promoted American business activities worldwide, for example, encouraging investments in Japan and China and securing permission for U.S. oil companies to drill throughout the Middle East. Their efforts to expand America's economic position in Latin America and Europe were quite successful. As President Hoover and as Secretary of State, Henry L. Stimson followed a similar approach. The U.S. and Latin America when Harding took office in 1921, the U.S. had troops in Cuba, Panama, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua. See the giant map, 21.2. Uh, During the campaign, Harding had criticized Wilson's bayonet rule in Haiti and the Dominican Republic and promised to end those occupations. To maintain American dominance in the Caribbean, however, U.S. officials wanted stable and friendly local governments. Therefore, American administrators kept some control over each nation's finances and trained its military and police forces. American troops left Cuba in 1922, the Dominican Republic in 1924, Nicaragua in 1932, and Haiti in 1934. In the Dominican Republic and in Haiti, however, the U.S. kept control of the Customs House and tariff revenues until the 1940s. When American troops withdrew from the Dominican Republic and Haiti, they left better roads, improved sanitation systems, well-equipped local police, and governments favorable to the U.S. But the years of occupation had not advanced the educational systems, the national economies, or most residents' standard of living. Nor had the U.S. promoted democracy, favoring stability instead, even if it meant accepting dictators such as Rafael Trujillo, who seized power in the Dominican Republic in 1930 and ruled brutally until his death in 1961. In Nicaragua, American forces left in 1925 but returned in 1926 to protect the pro-American government when civil war broke out. Coolidge sent Henry L. Stimson to negotiate a peace agreement that ended most fighting in 1927. However, Augusto Sandino, who wanted to rid Nicaragua of American influence, rejected the peace agreement and continued guerrilla warfare. Elsewhere in Latin America, American involvement was not military but commercial. Throughout Central America, American firms such as the U a United Fruit Company purchased thousands of acres for plantations to grow produce, especially bananas and coffee, for the American and European market. Organized in 1899, United Fruit came to exercise a powerful influence in several Central American countries. In Venezuela and Colombia, American oil companies, with State Department help, negotiated contracts for drilling rights, outmaneuvering European oil companies. U.S. investments in Latin America rose from nearly $2 billion in 1919 to over $3.5 billion in 1929. This is somewhat of an extension of dollar diplomacy that we saw under President Taft earlier. Oil played a key role in relations with Mexico. The Mexican Constitution of 1917 limited foreign ownership, and Mexico moved to nationalize its subsurface resources, including oil. American companies strongly objected. By 1925, American oil men and some members of the Coolidge administration were seeking military protection for American oil interests in Mexico. Coolidge instead sent his college friend, Dwight W. Morrow, as an ambassador to Mexico with specific instructions, keep us out of war with Mexico. Moro knew some Spanish, understood Mexican nationalism and pride, and cultivated a personal relationship with Mexican President Plutarco Calles. He succeeded in reducing tensions and delayed nationalization of oil until 1938. Following the election of 1928, President-elect Hoover undertook a tour of 11 Latin American countries seeking better relations. America and Europe. World War I shattered much of Europe physically and economically. The American economy soared to unprecedented heights, however, and the U.S. became the world's leading creditor nation, meaning that we extend lines of credit to others, they take out credit through us. After the war, Republican policymakers joined with business leaders to expand exports and to restrict imports. The Ford McCumber Tariff of 1922 set the highest rates ever for most manufactured imports. By significantly limiting European imports, the tariff made it difficult for Europeans to acquire the dollars they needed to repay their war debts in the United States. At the same time, Secretary of State Hughes and Secretary of Commerce Hoover worked to expand American economic interests in Europe. Ford, for example, built the largest automobile factory outside the U.S. and England and constructed a tractor factory in the Soviet Union. Hughes and Hoover were especially concerned about Germany. They reasoned that if Germany recovered economically and paid its $33 billion war reparations, other European nations would also recover and repay their debts. Encouraged by federal officials, Americans invested over $4 billion in Europe, doubling their investments there. General Motors purchased Opel, a German automobile firm, or excuse me, yeah, General Motors purchased Opel, a German automobile firm. 
Even so, Germany could not make its reparation payments, defaulting in 1923 to France and Belgium. In response, French troops occupied Germany's Ruhr Valley, a key economic region, igniting an international crisis. Hughes sent Charles G. Dawes, a Chicago banker and prominent Republican, to resolve the situation. Under the Dawes plan, American bankers loaned $2.5 billion to Germany for economic development. The Germans promised to pay $2 billion in reparations to the European allies, who in turn were to pay $2.5 billion in war debts to the United States. Though this circular flow of capital produced jokes at the time, it worked fairly well until 1929, when the Depression ended nearly all loans and payments. In the wider world, in hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic. In 1919, a German constitutional assembly wrote a liberal democratic constitution in the town of Weimar, so the new government was often referred to as the Weimar Republic. Not entirely sure that I'm pronouncing that right, we're just going to go with it. In 1921, the European allies demanded the reparations specified by the Versailles Treaty in the amount each year of more than 2 billion marks, the German unit of currency. Simultaneously, the Ford and McCumber tariff policy closed American markets to German exports. As a result, the German mark quickly collapsed. In early 1921, $1 was worth about 60 marks. By late 1923, $1 was worth 4 trillion marks. At the worst point, prices in Germany doubled every two days. In late 1923, the German government introduced a new currency that brought inflation under control. That, together with the Dawes plan, stabilized the German economy. However, the hyperinflation of 1921 to 23 is often credited with undermining many Germans' confidence in democracy and aiding the rise to power of Adolf Hitler in 1933. And before we move on, it's important to just point out that the Dawes Plan and the Dawes Act are not the same thing. The Dawes Plan here is intended to stabilize the German economy. The Dawes Act, um, that was many decades previously, 1860s, 1870s perhaps, um, that broke up reservation systems and assigned individual plots of land to Native American families. Encouraging international cooperation. Though committed to independent internationalism, Republican policymakers understood that some international cooperation was necessary to achieve policy goals and to solve international problems. On such issues, they were willing to cooperate with other nations and enter into international agreements, but only with the understanding that the U.S. was not entering an alliance or otherwise agreeing to commit resources or troops in defense of another nation. Disarmament was such an issue. The devastation of World War I had spurred calls for reducing armaments. In the U.S., support for arms cuts was widespread. In early 1921, Senator William E. Bora of Idaho suggested an international conference to reduce the size of the world's navies. Fearing that naval expenditures would prevent tax cuts, Secre uh, Treasury Secretary Mellon joined the disarmament chorus. American policymakers also had concerns about Japan. The U.S. and Britain had the largest navies, roughly equal in strength, and had no interest in expanding them. Japan, the next largest naval power, wanted to expand its navy. Americans worried the Japanese pressures on China would endanger Chinese territory and the open-door policy. Given these two areas of concern, Harding and Hughes tried to host, or excuse me, agreed to host international discussions on limiting the size of navies and ensuring the status quo in China. In November of 1921, Harding invited the major naval powers to Washington to, to discuss reducing the crushing burdens of military and naval establishments. When the delegates assembled for the Washington Naval Conference, Hughes shocked them with a radical proposal. Scrap nearly two million tons of warships, mostly battleships. He also called for a 10-year ban on naval construction and limits on the size of navies, a proposal aimed especially at the Japanese. Hughes suggested a ratio of 5 to 5 to 3 for the U.S., Britain, and Japan, with Italy and France allocated 1.7 each. Hughes's plan garnered immediate support among both the American public and most of the participating nations, but not Japan. Calling Hughes's ratio an insult, the Japanese demanded equality. Discussions dragged on for two months, but the Japanese finally agreed. U.S. intelligence had broken the Japanese diplomatic code, so Hughes knew the Japanese delegates had orders to concede if he held firm. In February 1922, the U.S., Britain, Japan, France, and Italy agreed to build no more capital ships for 10 years and to abide by the 5-5-3-1.7-1.7 ratio for future shipbuilding. Hughes, according to a British observer, had sunk more British ships than all the admirals of the world. The nations also agreed to prohibit the use of poison gas and not to attack one another's Asian, possession, Asian possessions. Another treaty affirmed the sovereignty and territorial boundaries of China and guaranteed equal commercial access to China, thereby maintaining the open door. Hughes considered the meeting successful, though critics complained that there were no enforcement provisions and no mention of smaller ships. Other attempts to reduce armaments had mixed outcomes. In 1930, Britain, the U.S., and Japan established ratios for cruisers and destroyers similar to those of the Washington Conference. By the mid-1930s, however, Japan's demands for naval equality ended British and American cooperation and spurred new naval construction by all three countries. Many Americans and Europeans applauded the achievements of the Washington Naval Conference, but wanted to go further to end wars. In 1923, Senator Bora proposed a Senate resolution outlawing war. In 1924, La Follette campaigned for a national referendum as a requirement for declaring war. 
In 1927, the French Foreign Minister Aristide Briand suggested a pact formally outlawing war between uh, the France and war between the France and the United States, privately hoping such an agreement would commit the United States to aid France if attacked. Secretary of State Kellogg instead suggested a multilateral statement opposing war, thereby removing any hint of an, any American commitment to aid. On August 27, 1928, the U.S. and 14 other nations, including Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and Japan, signed the Pact of Paris, or the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which renounced war as an instrument of foreign policy and agreed to settle disputes peacefully. This was a pact that tried to outlaw going to war. And if you're sitting there thinking, doesn't World War II start about a decade later, you'd be totally right. Eventually, 64 nations signed, but the pact included no enforcement provisions, meaning they have no way to enforce it. Nearly every signatory reserved its right to self-defense also. Thus, by 1928, American independent internationalism seemed a success. Investments and loans by American businesses were fueling an expanding world economy and contributing to American prosperity. The U.S. had protected its Asian and Pacific interests against Japan while protecting China and promoting disarmament and world peace. In Latin America, the U.S. had withdrawn some troops from the Caribbean and avoided intervention in Mexico. Foreign policies based on economic expansion and non-coercive diplomacy appeared to be launching an era of cooperation and peace in world affairs. Individual voices, sexuality, and innuendo in movie advertising. The great popularity of movies in the 1920s meant that historians are interested in ways that the films may have influenced people's behavior. The movie ads on this page and earlier in the chapter bring together three of the significant changes of the 1920s. The movies themselves, the growth of advertising as a way to attract consumers, and changing attitudes regarding sexuality. I do suggest that you, again, go to the physical book and take a look here on page 596. Um, it's not going to, I think, be really effective for me just to simply describe to you these posters. I think you really do have to see them for yourself. Summary. The 1920s were a decade of prosperity. Unemployment was low, productivity grew steadily, and many Americans fared well. Sophisticated advertising campaigns created bright expectations and installment buying freed consumers from paying cash right away. Many consumers bought more, stimulating manufacturing and expanding personal debt. Expectations of continuing prosperity encouraged speculation and the stock market boomed. Agriculture did not share in this prosperity. During the Roaring Twenties, Americans experienced significant social change. More and more Americans lived in cities. The automobile, radio, and movies, along with immigration restriction, produced a more homogenous culture. Many American intellectuals, however, rejected the consumer-oriented culture. During the 1920s, African Americans produced an outpouring of significant art, literature, and music in the Harlem Renaissance. Some young people rejected traditional constraints, and one result was the emergence of a youth culture. Think about the flappers for that. Not all Americans embraced change. Some tried to maintain or restore earlier cultural values. The outcomes were mixed. Prohibition was largely unsuccessful. Fundamentalism grew and prompted a campaign against the teaching of evolution, talking about the Scopes monkey trial there. Nativism helped define, uh, helped define significant restrictions on immigration, thinking about the National Origins Act of 1924 there. The Ku Klux Klan committed to nativism, traditional values, and white supremacy experienced nationwide growth until 1925, but it declined sharply thereafter. Discrimination and occasional violence continued to affect the lives of people of color. Federal Indian policy had long stressed assimilation and allotment, but some groups now advocated more respect for Indian cultural values, thinking they're the Dawes Plan. Immigrants from Mexico came especially to California, Texas, and other parts of the Southwest. Some working in agriculture tried unsuccessfully to organize unions. Nearly all unions faced strong opposition from employers. Some older gender roles for women broke down as women gained the right to vote and exercised more control over having children. A gay and lesbian subculture became more visible, especially in cities. Politics were markedly more conservative than before World War I. Warren G. Harding was a poor judge of character and some of his appointees were revealed as corrupt. Um, Mr. Return to Normalcy was not a very successful president. Under Harding and his successor Calvin Coolidge, the conservative federal government lionized business, minimized regulation, and encouraged speculation. With some exceptions, progressive reform disappeared from politics and efforts to secure federal assistance for farmers failed. Herbert Hoover defeated Al Smith in, in the 1928 presidential election in which the values of an older rural America seemed to be pitted against those of the new urban immigrant society. During the 1920s, the U.S. followed a policy of independent internationalism that stressed voluntary cooperation among nations, while at the same time enhancing opportunities for American business around the world. Relations with Latin America improved somewhat, and the Washington Naval Conference held out the hope for limiting naval armaments. <laughs> 